Chapter Eight of the House on the Downs by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gypsy Tinker. Mark approached the hollow and, parting the tangle of branches and twigs, peered into the dingle. A bright fire was crackling near the spot where the body of Craddock Rayner had lain. Suspended from a tripod over the fire hung a black kettle which steamed and bubbled merrily, sending forth a savory and appetizing odor. A man was standing by the kettle, a queer, undersized, gypsy-looking fellow, clad in shabby velveteens with leather breeches and gaiters. He wore a felt slouch hat, brass rings in his ears, a scarlet waistcoat, and a gaudy neckerchief. The leaping flames revealed a swarthy, gnarled, and weather-beaten face, with shrewd black eyes and a wide mouth. The flames also showed a tilt cart in the background, a shaggy pony browsing nearby, and the implements of the tinker's trade strewn around on the ling and creeping vines. Fazenta Lee was talking earnestly with the tinker. They did not observe Mark looking through the thicket, nor could he see anything of the man who had followed Fazenta, but he had a distinct impression that the fellow was somewhere at hand, peering into the hollow and listening for what he could hear. Mark was about to draw back, for he perceived that Fazenta's business with the gypsy tinker was private and urgent, when certain significant words from the latter held his attention. "'Bide a bit, Fazenta, and we'll do some searching. You must have kicked it far under the brambles, for it ain't visible hereabouts. I've sharp eyes to see aught of that sort. I'll light a lantern, and we'll scour under every bush and vine. No need to start worritin. We'll root it out and bury it deep afore ever them police come back to search. If they haven't found it already, Fazenta shivered. "'Not much likelihood of that,' scoffed the tinker. "'I'll lay a tidy bit of money. My eyes be sharper than theirs.' He picked up some wood and replenished the fire. Then he walked away to his cart, dived under its tilt, drew out a lantern, and lighted it. "'Hold this, Fazenta, he directed, "'and I'll do the ferretin under they bushes.' Zealously and patiently the gypsy tinker searched under the bushes and vines of the hollow. The rays from the lantern held by Fazenta showed the tenseness of her features. At length the tinker rose stiffly to his feet, shaking his head gloomily. "'It ain't here now, Fazenta, that's flat.' She set down the lantern with hand that trembled. "'Then the police have it.' There was tragedy in her voice. Through the tangle of twigs and brambles, the man who had been trailing Fazenta forced his way into the hollow. The firelight played upon his face, a keen, hard face, with prominent, aggressive jaw. Fazenta Lee uttered a startled cry. Her great dark eyes were those of a trapped and desperate thing. "'Who are you, and what do you want here?' she demanded. "'I might ask the same of you,' the intruder retorted, with a curious drawling enunciation. "'A place where a man was found murdered only a few hours ago is a devilish queer rendezvous in the night time. What were you and this fellow hunting for under the bushes?' Was it by any chance a blood-stained dagger with a jeweled handle? Out with it now, young woman. The tinker edged over to his cooking pot and tilted the lid. Don't want my supper to boil over, he mumbled. Fazenta Lee stood rigid, staring dumbly at her questioner. Better find a tongue, young woman, he advised her roughly. I have authority back of me. I am Detective Inspector Burton from New Scotland Yard, sent down here to investigate the murder of Craddock Rayner. Fazenta, one hand on her quick-moving bosom, stood her ground. In the glow of the fire, her tawny cheeks flamed. "'I have nothing to do with any murdered man. I am a gypsy, and gypsies roam where it pleases them, whether tis night or day, and give no account to anyone.' "'That won't do,' said the detective harshly. "'I know your story. You're no common gypsy. You have been the ward of Sir Quentin Rotherdean down at the Grange, and I've trailed you from there to this thicket where Craddock Rayner was murdered a few hours ago.' You came here to search for the dagger that killed him. It is useless to deny it. The bullying tones of the detective's voice whipped Fazenta's Romany blood into heat. But I choose to deny it, she declared passionately, and you've no proof, only wild imaginings. Better get back to New Scotland Yard. You'll gain nothing but weary legs by trailing me over the downs. Detective Inspector Burton's jaw set hard. I intend to have proof of many things, young woman, by the time the coroner's court sits. He turned sternly to the tinker, who, fur divide, was casting an armful of twigs on the fire. "'You will be subpoenaed for the inquest, too, my man. Your name? No lies now. It won't help you.' The gypsy straightened up and touched the brim of his slouch hat. "'I ain't likely to lie, governor. I be too well known hereabouts. 
My name's Sylvester Shaw. Tinner Shaw, folks call me, for because I'm a traveling tinker. I camps often here in Rotherdean Hollow, and so tonight, when I drives back from Glindway, I comes here again, not knowing aught of no murder, and what I was searching for, Governor, were a knife for skin and rabbits, what I'd lost last time I camped here. Burton viewed him with disfavor. You can tell that tale at the inquest. He drew out a small memorandum, and stepping nearer the fire, made some rapid notes. I'd like a word with you in private, Tinner Shaw. The young woman, Fazenta Lee, I take it, had better be getting back to the Grange. There's nothing to be found here, and the place is under police surveillance. Your village inspector, name of Haskett, I believe, has a man posted somewhere about the thicket. So you've been under observation, Tinner, from the moment you pitched your camp here. Shaw stooped to gather up more twigs. That's as may be, Governor, he said laconically. I ain't done aught of harm here, only searched for my own rabbit knife. He looked up slyly at Fazenta. Please give my respects to Sir Quentin, and thank him kindly for his offer a taking me on as under gamekeeper. But I be only a gypsy vagrant, and settled work and settled lodging ain't in my line. Them o' my turn o' mind wants only to lodge in the open under the stars. I'm too old now to get civilized, in a manner of speaking, like you and young Rodney, I'm fair content as I am. Fazenta's gaze swept the fragrant dingle with its dark, mystical recesses, lingered upon the glowing fire, the peacefully browsing pony. Overhead in the great wide vault of the sky, the moon and the stars were paling before the coming dawn. The noises of the little creatures of the night, the stoat and the weasel, the timid hare, the flapping bat, even the hoot of the owl, were hushed in expectancy of another day. Fazenta's throat contracted, her breath came quick and eager with emotion. You have much to be content with, Sylvester Shaw. And yet, her voice deepened, for all I love the freedom and the grandeur of the downs, I can never come back to them and be wholly a Romany again. Tinner Shaw's shrewd, sun and wind stained face showed a ready sympathy. In a manner of speaking, he said philosophically, tis the curse of civilization holds you back. You may call it that, Sylvester. I have gained much and lost much. Fazenta turned sharply away. Without even a glance at Detective Inspector Burton, she went out through a gap in the thicket. Mark watched her mounting with rapid step the winding path to the heath-clad plateau above. In the shadow of a clump of beeches, he lost sight of her, and he decided to return at once to the Grange, having no wish to be discovered and interrogated by Detective Inspector Burton. As he walked along over the slopes of the downs, in the wan, uncertain light between dying night and quickening day, there came at length a glory into the east. A lark rose from its nest in the turf, singing joyously as it soared straight up into the air. Mark went on happily, the gloom of last night's tragedy banished for the moment. As he rounded a curve of the grassy lane, he came suddenly upon Fazenta Lee, standing on a tiny, furze-grown common. She was looking eastward, where now, over the bare line of the hills, a broad band of crimson was slowly widening. From elder and thorn bushes came the piping of blackbird and missile thrush. The glory of the dawn was reflected on Fenzenta's features, heightening her dark Romany beauty. Then she saw Mark, and the radiance died from her face. Mr. Brandon, she exclaimed in dismay. He read and answered the mute question in her eyes, the question of whether he, too, had followed her from the Grange. As considerately as possible, he told her why he had done so, and just how much he had seen and heard in Rotherdean Hollow. When he finished, Fazenta looked distressed and worried, but not angry. I suppose you think badly of me, Mr. Brandon. I can't let myself think badly of one whom my old friend Sir Quentin thinks so highly of, he answered gently. You are kind to say that, she declared, but of course you cannot help having suspicions of me, like that detective from London. The worst of it is I cannot explain. You will have to trust or distrust me, as you see fit. I am going to trust you, he said simply, but I want to give a bit of friendly advice. I know tragedy is touching you. Take your trouble to Sir Quentin and confide in him fully. For many years he stood in the place of a father to you. He will not fail you now. Ah, no, she cried sharply. Sir Quentin must know nothing of all this. Mr. Brandon, as a favor, a very special favor, won't you give me your word that you will say nothing of what you have seen or heard tonight, either to Sir Quentin or to anyone else? You have my word that I will not, Miss Lee, but I earnestly advise you to confide in Sir Quentin. 
By his kindness and affection for you, he has merited your confidence in everything that touches you closely. Something of the dawn's glory came back to Facenta's face. It is just because of his heavenly goodness to me that I would not have him worried and made wretched. But he is bound to hear of this at the inquest through that detective chap. Both you and Tinner Shaw will be questioned. We will deny anything of an incriminating nature that the detective accuses us of having said or done, she protested. Sylvester Shaw is a good friend to me, and he is devoted to Sir Quentin, too. Many a time Sir Quentin has saved him from being jailed for poaching. Tinner Shaw once belonged to the same gypsy camp that Rodney Sherrod and I lived in as children. Perhaps you don't know that a malignant fever carried off every person in that camp except Sylvester, Rodney, and myself. The camp was here on the downs, and Sir Quentin used to visit it and was friendly with us all. When he adopted Rodney and me, he bought a tinker's outfit, pony and cart, too, for Sylvester Shaw, and there is nothing Sylvester would not do for him. And nothing you would not do for him either, Fazenta Lee? A rich tide of color warmed the Romany's cheeks. Nothing on earth, Mr. Brandon. Except to give him your confidence in tonight's bad business, Mark pointed out. You don't understand, Mr. Brandon. It is to save him suffering. But if trouble isn't faced squarely, the consequences are almost certain to descend upon someone. I am the only one they can descend upon, she answered unmoved. I'm not going back to the Grange just now, Mr. Brandon. The gypsy wanderlust is on me, and I've got to roam the downs till I work it out of my blood. You see, with a sad little smile, I am not entirely civilized yet. Sir Quentin understands, and he never scolds or even questions. He knows that when I put on gypsy dress that the Romany spirit is calling, and only the freedom of the downs can calm me. Oh, he has always been wonderfully sympathetic with the wild little Zingari girl he took into his home. Mark went on to the Grange. Once he looked back. The sun was spreading a shimmering mantle of gold over the Sussex hills, bringing forth the bright colors of the tiny flowers that gemmed the turfy lees. Fazenta, her face toward the sunrise, was climbing with eager steps a straight green track running steeply up to a bald, projecting ridge. Above her head wheeled a cloud of mingled rooks and starlings. Mark wondered if her restless Romany spirit would find peace on that lonely height she was seeking. End of chapter 8